Okay, so Smoke and Snow, Season 2, Episode 10. And when we last left our heroes, they had left the moor. Two of them had been pretty much carried out and only saved by the aid of strange magics that had been discovered in the depths. Unfortunately, during their combat with the mad necromancer in his tomb lair, Lam, the wife of Brock, fell in combat and they were forced to abandon her body. Later on, Quentin, looking through a crystal sphere that he had purloined from the now deceased apprentice of the man Necromancer, witnessed Lan laid out on some sort of sacrificial table or experimental altar with this Necromancer conducting a strange ceremony around her. That sort of fueled the anger of Brock and led to them wanting to gather their forces, return to the moor, and seek some of that sweet, sweet revenge against the evil necromancer. And that is where we're going to start off this session, with you all in the bustling town of New Zealand. You've pretty much just arrived back not long ago. You've done a little bit of healing while you were there, thanks to the, the strange liquid time magic that you found, which has now all been used up. But you are in the state you are in. You currently have what you have on you as per your sheet. There are there are potentially people you can hire within the town. Obviously, you don't know how much time you've got before the necromancer does whatever the necromancer is going to do. So it's pretty much over to you guys. We're going to assume, just for the sake of convenience at the start of this session, that you guys have all met up in the Hunter and Beetle, which is where you've been staying. You've done your bits of healing. Any personal equipment that you want to get, you can buy as standard costs from the town vendors. You can pretty much just deduct your gold and have that to your carriage sheet and assume you've already done that. Anything beyond that and hirelings and stuff like that, you will have to now sort of discuss in game and obviously that will take time to do so over to you guys as you meet up around a table in the bar of the hunter and beetle um yeah well we was talking about getting some hired help so i don't know if uh malcolm or quentin have had any time to do that while me and why mile were healing in our or time capsule or whatever we want to call it. No, because I think that was seconds for us. <clears throat> All right. Um, so, yeah, I think we should try and find some burly folks to help fight against the necromancer. Some bastard. Um, okay, so the way I'm going to work it in terms of hirelings is you can attempt to recruit hirelings or henchmen once per day and that that's by buying drinks putting notices up distributing like leaflets whatever which will cost you five gold pieces if you want you can also hire the services of the town crier which would increase the cost to 10 gold pieces but there's more chance of you getting like, multiple people because it'll be heard throughout the town you can attempt this multiple times but each time you attempt it it will take a day. I'll definitely go with the type crier because uh, I think we can get Weimar a bit more notoriety here. Yeah, I was going to say, would Weimar putting his name on it get a bit more chance of success? Potentially, yeah. Well, I'm going to regardless. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and John, we can each four of us can do it, and no, it's you, cost forty gold. You can do it once per group per day. Okay, so the group we do it as a group. Yeah, because this represents your your group effort going out distributing these notices and putting the word out and stuff like that. Okay, and then while uh, Brock is off looking for burly types, we'll be, you know, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, trying to find a healer on the QT. Okay. Um. So for the first day, if you're paying for the town cry, did up to ten gold pieces from your yeah, your party funds. Okay, so on the first day, you get seven potential people interested in your your offer. 
they're all human roughly half of them probably just over half of them seem like they're sort of they're interested but they're only great like martial prowess you know they'd probably be useful as like baggage handlers and torch bearers and stuff like that you do get a couple yeah you do get a couple of people um one is a, a man called parash and the other is a man called gartag who appear to be slightly more familiar with the the sort of martial arms um gartag is this strange looking um human who he has a odd tattoos but they're only on his eyelids so you only see him when he like blinks He's carrying a long sword and a dagger. He's got a leather armor and a, sh- a sort of round wooden shield strapped across his back. You obviously have a bit of a chance to chat to them all. He claims to have like once been a stable boy in New Zealand, like a lot a few years ago. The other Parash is a again a fairly large human who seems to have like shaved his head and he's like in clean shaven all over. He's got chainmail, a shield, but and he carries a, a large, sort of quite crude-looking club. You you see him sort of doing a little bit of practice fighting. They're obviously not of the level that you describe for like being like an official like fighter, as in the player character class. But they're definitely more experienced at fighting than the mess of like other people have applied. Ah, oh, I suggest we. Sign those two up, do you think? Yeah, and maybe one of the regular guys as a teamster. Yep. Okay, so Parash and Gartag are willing to sign up for one gold piece a day. Nice. As Man at Arms. Out of the others, they're, they're, again, they're all human, as I say. There is a, there is a, a couple that strike you as a little bit odd. There's about six of them in all. The, the few that strike you as a little bit odd is there's a man called Kilmar, who appears to have a large pet rat in his pocket that he talks to almost constantly. And he seems of a quite nervy disposition. He's always sort of glancing around. Um, there is a man called Cargos who literally like he only strikes you as odd because the first thing he does when he sort of like poles up to say yes I'm interested in the job is he slaps this massive wheel of cheese down on the table and he sort of like carves a big slice of it off for himself and he's like eating it with like a little knife and he like offers some out to you while he's like chatting to you about it and he's, he's telling you about how he used to be like a crofter back in the day the other one who strikes you as slightly different is a man called Talon who has like a, a sort of hooded you would recognize this Quentin as like your standard sort of like thieves cloak you even spot a couple of like little bulges which most people would have like not seen which you recognize as hidden pockets but that's the only thing that really strikes you as odd about him it's more range support most of the most of the sort of torchbearer style people only really seem to be armed with like daggers and they don't, because obviously, you know, you don't tend to, unless you've got a position, you don't tend to walk around with like arms on display in a town. So most of them are just carrying daggers, you know, that's a tool rather than like sp- specifically an offensive weapon. They don't really appear to have any armor or such like. So if you wanted to take one of them and you want them to be like, say, range support or something, you'd probably have to equip them. Well, we'll see how good they are at ranged, to be fair, before we equip them. Okay, well, you said you only wanted to hire like one of the torch bearers. You've got a choice of five. I'll get them all on the range. See which one manages to hit the target closest. Okay. So... Hey, we can take more. Just to don't stop and take more if you want. More. No, we, we don't Just... need. We need more muscle than we need ranged. True. Just whichever one it doesn't. We don't take for range. We should just take to look after the horses and. What now? Okay, let me just make a quick roll. Okay, so you give them all a try with like one of your crossbows, you know, like oh, here's a here's a target. Um, try shooting that with like a few bolts, and on average, the one who appears to do the best is Cargos, who is the guy who like 
plonked down the wheel of cheese. Okay, we'll take wheel of cheese and we'll take the hooded figure as a okay. a backup. <laughs> okay, so you also take Talon as well. And the the torch bearers agree to work for five silver pieces a day. Uh, so are you taking those two and I'll take Kilmore then as a team sir and we'll take three of them yeah okay I need an alchemist okay so that is who you've got on your first day's recruiting Obviously, you could spend more time at recruiting other people if you wished, but obviously that would take more time. How much is a, a small barrel of black powder? Bum, 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 bum. Let me just have a look. I honestly can't remember. I assume why I need some. Sorry, what does he need? Black powder. Yeah, not acutely, but, but yeah. Also, no, if we get enough barrel. of it, <laughs> yeah, we could use it as explosives. Okay, yes. just give me a second. I'm just looking for... Uh... For my details on black powder. Black powder, there we go. Boom, 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 boom. Okay, given that it's given that it's fairly rare, you probably wouldn't be able to find anyone who would sell you a a whole barrel of black powder. Just because of like how much it's worth, they know they can get more money by just like doling it out. Um, an ammunition pouch, which has enough balls or shot, powder, wadding, and cord for twenty shots, costs five gold pieces. Well, if I take ten of them, that's ten potential explosives. Yeah. <laughs> You take ten, take ten of them. Obviously, it costs you fifty gold pieces, and effectively gives you enough everything for two hundred shots. Does that sound good, Wymore? Can we turn that into a, a explosion? I'd be very surprised if you couldn't. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, I wonder if we could make like grenades or something. I, I was thinking like a glass bottle, some black powder, you shot inside it, give it a fuse. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, I mean, sure. Okay, so if you're buying, uh, if you're buying your ten ammunition pouches, cross fifty gold pieces off your your group fund, and that gets you ten ammunition pouches, which is enough for two hundred shots all told. And that's the that's the metal balls, like I said, the powder, the wadding, and the cord, and everything you need for two hundred shots. It's not just the black powder. How much is fuse fuse wire? Uh, that that would come with the ammunition pouch. Okay, so we're, you, we're good. You'd be so we just need that. to collect up. Yeah, some, cause, uh, cause I mean, if you're planning on like collecting all the black powder together into making like a big bomb or three, you'd probably be, you'd have because obviously you get the the cord for each shot. You could probably like attach them together just to make like, a longer fuse for. That's the plan. If like I say, if we get some um, either some ceramic or glass bottles yep. and make these little explosives obviously be well out of the fucking way when it goes off <clears throat> yeah obviously but uh, if he intends to send any more zombies up some stairs we can give them a couple of explosions yeah 
makes sense. Uh, John, I'm going to buy leather armor for. I need, you said the the two expensive hirelings both have armor already, did he? Yeah, Parash has chainmail and a shield, and Gartag has leather armor and a shield. It's the okay. two torchbearers, Kargos and Talon, who don't have their own armor. They just come with daggers initially. So okay. get them crossbows, bolts, armor. Okay. Uh, just give me a second. Yeah, sorry, John. You also heard that we we're going to pick up um, Kilmore as our um, teamster. Okay, no problems. Um, Again, it'll work for five silver pieces a day. Yeah. Cool. So we got all three letter, and then. Uh, Okay, and then we want three crossbows and then whatever, 60-odd bolts. Okay, no problems. Yeah, you'll be able to get them for the standard costs. Cool, yeah. Okay, so... Oh, are we taking the um, Scholar with us again? Um, yeah, he's still looking for the uh, the healing stone or whatever you call it, isn't it? So he probably still yeah. wants to go, doesn't he? We've got the glasses, so do we really need him? Um, oh, uh, he was rather helpful last time when push came to a very harsh shove. Mm. <laughs> when it's, when it would save his own neck. <laughs> yeah, but it is just one more body we've got to protect, isn't it? You don't have to protect them that hard, though. Y'all, come on. It was fucking useless. Yeah, well, I more meant it would be okay if something happened to him. Well, this way something doesn't have to happen to him, so... I think what Quentin's trying to say is, like, why go through all the trouble of taking him out not protecting him and having him die when we could just not take him in the first place true but i kind of like there's no real trouble to just watch him die <coughs> that, is, that is also true unless he grows another eye in the back of his head yeah <laughs> unless he does know how to use this stone if we do find it that would be quite useful i don't think he's got a clue well, I think he'd probably got more clue than Brock, but yeah, I don't know if he'd know. I'm not bothered either way. I'm, I'm just I'm thinking, if we take him, it. we've got to assign one of these guys to look after him. Of course, he's stupid. I mean, you could leave him outside with and the animals and the teamster. He's got to die at some point. Okay, so at the end of the first day, after going around, hiring the town crier, sending out your leaflets, asking around in numerous places, you know, putting the word out, name dropping Weimar as the Castellan of New Zealand, etc., and like having to like interview these people and sort of do your crossbow tests and stuff like that, you've ended up with five hirelings. You've got Cargos now equipped with leather and armor and a crossbow as a torchbearer the guy with the cheese you've got kilmar again torchbearer leather armor crossbow the with the pat rat who sort of seems a bit furtive and a bit nervous you've got um talon again torchbearer with the hooded cloak with the thieves secret pockets in it and you've got parash and gartag who are your slightly more sort of competent men at arms who put their own weapons and armor with them Only thing you've noticed about those two is, as I say, Gartag has these strange tattoos on his eyelids, and occasionally you notice that Parash seems to be like writing in like a diary or something. He's got like a small book, and occasionally he gets out like an ink pot and a quill, and he like writes something in this book and then just like, tucks it away. So 
So then are we uh, storming the castle? I guess if Brock doesn't want to wait to hire more people tomorrow. No, not really. So then we should probably just crack on. <laughs> now, the, there is a small, slim chance that Land's alive. I'm just pointing that out. It's slim, Brock. Hmm. Slim's better than none, but either way, whoever done this is going to feel the wrath. So let's go before they escape. Okay, so you set out. Are you planning to cross the cross the lake to the moor in the same place you did originally? Obviously, it's still marked down as the uh, the last type ferry, although. It's, I think it's that's little, where we left the ferry anyway. I was so. going to say, yeah, it's a little more than like a, a half-ruined shack that you guys dumped the boat in last time, because obviously uh, mm. old uh, Rem isn't there anymore after his traitorous activities previously. All right, so it's going to be a half-party over, half-party over. Yeah. Okay, so the first day you travel across the plains towards this small wooden shack... It still appears to be there. I'm going to ask one of you. Um, Brock, can you please roll me a d12? Anything but a 1, and the boat's still there. A 4. Okay, and then I'm going to ask, can all of you please roll me a d12? And if any of you get a 12, let me know. Oh. When we're crossing, we'll do the usual routine of taking off for any armour, yeah. other than maybe leather. But. Yeah, no problems. No, I've got four. Okay. Mm-hmm. So you make it... Obviously, you have to deduct a ration for each of you, and that includes an additional five rations for your like, hirelings. Because it looks like it's going to take you... It's going to take you a day to get to the crossing. It's pretty much getting to, to late tonight by the time you get there. You've obviously had, a, had to have a couple of rest stops on the way, you know, to eat, refresh your water, etc. The weather's been fairly reasonable. Nothing's occurred that's sort of caused you any great distress on the way there, other than the mission you're already involved in. And as as darkness is sort of like falling deeper and deeper, as you arrive at the hut, you can see that indeed the the small, slightly rickety wooden craft you used previously to cross the lake to the, the island of the moor is still there. Do you guys cross over this evening or do you wait until the morning? I think we might as well wait till the morning. Yeah, I don't think there's any advantage in going now, is there? No. Okay. Okay, so the the night passes fairly uneventfully. You all wake up the next morning. The sun is rising over the horizon. You see the glassy, clear surface of the lake stretching out ahead of you. And then the small, sort of dark, sandy beaches and rocky fronts of the moor lying across the, the calm, still waters of the lake. Yeah, I'll be up super early, keen to get the boat ready and get people uh, moving on. Okay, no problems. We'll have to go across in two two boat loads, I guess. Yeah, it takes you a little time, so you say it's the double journey, but you've got enough people to sort of like protect where you've landed and stuff like that. So you rapidly make your way across to the moor you see this rocky sort of not barren but sort of fairly inhospitable island that you've now come to know pretty well with its large crevasse the titular moor sort of sinks down into the middle of the island and obviously you know the ways to get to the moor are we killing the pig mayor i think let's give the pigs uh, a, a birth 
this time because uh, we want to get down there with everything tip top. Okay, go around then. Yeah, and can we try and um, hide the boat as best as possible? Because last chance we left it a bit to chance that it would still be there. I don't know if there's much in the way of. Oh, well, I guess we can leave Come Kilmore on. with it, right? Yeah, you can leave Kilmore with the boat. That's not a problem. I'll make it out of that. Then at least we know it should be there. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the rest of you start heading into the island. You give the, the strange inbred village of Swinsmouth a... I think it's safe to say a fairly wide berth. And you make your way down the passage... That you used previously to gain access to the beast's maw. Right, and everybody tied themselves together. Yep. Obviously, you guys have been here before. You know that on the entrance to the cave, the, the winds threaten to whip you off the side of the chasm. So you take your time, you rope yourselves together as you have done previously. Since you've been here a couple of times and you know what to do, I'm not going to ask you to make a roll this time because you prepared, you knew this was going to happen. You make your way along up to the, the, the large slab of stone, which now you can sort of bypass quite easily, which once served as a door. Where do you wish to head? Are we going to just go straight to the Necromancer or did you want to clear out each floor? Well, we've explored this floor, you know, mainly. Uh, Except most for the laughing mushrooms. Uh, I thought that was down one. It is. I thought that was on the middle floor, yeah. I think this top floor we've pretty much explored. Apart from what looks like one corridor. Uh, I'm not saying it couldn't be re-inhabited, but I mean, that's not our our mission as far as Brock's concerned. So he, he's keen to take the shortest route down okay. to the well, next level. Okay, well, if, you know, you know the way, so. well, well, if Brock's taking the lead as it seems to be, would you like to move yourself to where, move the token to where you're heading next, Brock? Um... And we'll sort of move a room at a time. So did we go... Which route did we take? Did we take the downward arrow at the top in the end? It was the one next to A14 that led That's us. the one we went, was it? Okay. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to... Yeah, it was this one. Yeah. I'm going to go right at this T-junction then. Okay. Um, and head sort of A5, A14, that route. Yep, so... As you head up here, continuing to area A5, you notice the, the sort of filthy lair full of dung, bones and half-rotted furs that was previously occupied by the trolls before you cleared it out. Mm. You continue walking through this tunnel that slopes slightly downwards and you head into the, the strange sort of moss and fungal grotto where there are dead bodies and what appear to be the remnants of the trolls' previous meals. They have moss and fungi growing across their bodies. Do you continue moving on? Yeah, we'll continue up and then take the east corridor. Okay. Uh, so you're heading down. Yep. Okay. You start making your way down the passage to the next level. Is there any fresh signs of any trolls or anything as we're travelling through? Make me a, a hunting roll. Uh, the, what's it done on now? D6, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, oh, so let me know if you five or six, I need. Okay, Five so and six. Sorry. You look around, you do see signs of what you think to be like some small sort of cave animals and there's bits of like 
guano and stuff like that but you don't see any signs of like the passage of larger creatures that are fresh okay that's I'll good make a, i'll make a quick roll to see a couple of rolls see if anything happens while you're moving around no there's no nothing looms out of the darkness to menace you as you make your way through and down this slanted so sort of descending natural cavernous corridor to the level below whereupon you find yourself stood at a junction you know that to the east leads to a jagged sort of chamber that juts out over this impossibly deep abyss whereas the chamber to the south is the area occupied by the giant forest of mushrooms where you discovered the the secret sort of passage to make your way into the the sort of temple the, the first level of the temple bypassing the the seemingly haunted chamber you also know that in a small sort of sub chamber to the west there is a a very deep sort of hole that appears to like drop down through multiple lower levels you when you looked down it previously and that's sort of here i'm talking about when you looked down it previously you could see it went down at least 80 foot to what must have been like a level below this but it carried on even further down but you couldn't see any further okay where do you just go? go straight to it then brock yeah we're we head south and uh work our way through the mushroom cavern heading to that sort of secret corridor we found on the uh, west side i'll beware the screeching noise okay you make your way into the giant mushroom forest and reminded by Quentin, you avoid these sort of large violet coloured mushrooms that seem to emit this shrieking sound. And you've been here a couple of times, so you know what they look like now. So I'm not going to ask you to make a roll to avoid them, especially since Quentin's just pointed out. So as all this is going on, um, Weimar and Malcolm, are you doing anything in particular while you're sort of moving through this uh, this cavernous areas? No, uh, Weimar is entirely focused on what's at the bottom. Okay, no problems. So, you make your way through the secret passage and towards the Church of the Blessed Lightbringer. You emerge out of the the secret sort of way through this small crack in the stone wall into the by now familiar burial chamber with these four sorry three sort of stone sarcophagi in them so this this gateway was open wasn't it the one to it the, is, yeah. the west yeah it was yes, the, one the one downstairs, downstairs. yeah it was the yeah. problem one and then the screeching stone was straight after it so we need to try and avoid that yeah Okay. Yeah, I'll, well, I'm going to head towards this, the stairs and start taking my way down the stairs. Yep, you head through the empty open portcullis and start making your way down the stairs. But definitely stop in at the bottom of the stairs to uh, be cautious. Okay, yeah. And I'm not going to put um, specific tokens on for your like, guys. They are still there. But like we don't really need specific tokens for them unless they come into play. Yep. I'll leave yeah. Fa I'll leave Fabrio on there because he's already got a token. But beware of the screeching stone. <laughs> okay, so as you make your way down this stone staircase, you indeed find yourself back at this arcanely sealed portcullis that you narrowly just managed to prise open last time to effect your escape from this level as you're being attacked by these uh, these giant vermin that bubbled up from the levels below. So if I remember rightly, last time we didn't have any trouble going through it from this direction. It was only when we tried to come back we had all the problem, didn't we? That's correct. Hmm. Um, is there anything we can use to prop it up, do you think? Maybe uh, the lid of one of those sarcophagus or something on its side or... Well, you know that the, as you know from what Malcolm told you previously, the, the five chambers to the north 
are all pretty much identical burial chambers with a stone sarcophagi in. Yeah, you could probably take the lid off one of those and use it to like prevent the the portcullis from coming down fully. Hmm. I was just thinking we if we use one from upstairs, then we could do it before we even go through. So yeah, that we that's true. we haven't got the problem of trying to open hey, it from the other side. I'm all for cracking open a couple of coffins. I think we'd oh no, we had opened the ones on this, but we hadn't did, we didn't open the ones above, did we? I don't believe so, no. We should just no, be careful though, because Yeah. We killed a load of people on this floor and then someone got away when we were killing them on the top floor. Um so they'll be aware of us. Just wanna make sure it's not trapped or alarmed in any way. Mm. So how are we gonna uh, negotiate this? Screeching is that something that Quintin's got any skills with regards to we could try disarm it? it? And um, it was just a, a face, yeah. It, it was a the, the the pillar has a number of like stone carved skulls on it, they're not actual skulls, they're made of stone. But when you went through previously, one of them animated briefly, opened its mouth, and emitted a loud shrieking sound. And then the portcullis slammed down and seemed to have sealed itself. We can try and blindfold it. Did we notice any sort of pressure on a like a stone or anything? Depress, you know, like a we stood on something that triggered it, or not that you noticed at the time. We didn't. We didn't notice what triggered it. No. Which pillar was it? It was the. It was the first pillar. This one here. Okay. And was it on a specific side? Um, it was on the side facing the portcullis. Oh, okay. look, looking towards it. But we're already in line of sight of it. Yeah, it was only when we opened or went through the gate, wasn't it? Yep. Last time. Is there um? Is it sticking out or protruding from the pillar? A little bit, but not more so than any of the other stone carved scores are around it okay do we think it might be possible to like throw a sack over it and it would catch on top and cover the face um, is it protruding enough for that you couldn't throw it over it however if you had like because the the pillar is not particularly like wide if you had like a big enough sack you could effectively like wrap it around the pillar and sort of tie it on i mean you could use a spear and sort of poke it through ah, to start on. with hold on if to, like, get, cover it get some sack and we get some oil, we should be able to throw it and it'll stick. And that should give us enough time then to get behind and secure, securely hide its face. Well, we can try it anyway. Did we step in before? Well, we're all still this side of the gate, aren't we? So if yeah. it's short, we're, what's going to happen? Yeah, we'll try it. Okay, so I'll, I'll get some rag, John, some okay. oil. <laughs> Make the rag nice and sticky. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you soak and then... it. So that, <laughs> that will be one use of your oil. Yeah. And then I'm going to throw it flat-wise yep. at the thing rather than a bunched-up mess. Okay, so make me a dex check. So roll a d20. You need to get equal to or less in your dex. I got equal. Okay, and that's absolutely fine. So yet yeah, you soak this rag, this big sort of sack, in oil, sort of making it as big a surface area as you can, and then you like throw it, and with a wet like, it sticks to the. You throw it a bit high because you know it's going to like slide down slowly. Yeah. It sticks to it, sort of covering the skull, and then very slowly starts to sort of slide down. Well, I'll open the gate as soon as it's sort of hit the pillar basically yep as you correctly surmised opening the gate to get in has never been an issue you just like you start lifting it and the portcullis just then goes and that slides up allowing free and easy access to the corridor beyond and this time i'm going to sort of hold it above my head to make it easier to try and hold it back if it tries to sort okay. of force itself down whilst quentin tries to secure this rag or whatever okay. I'll, I'll slide in there and Yep. I'll check the floor for any precious things. Okay, so 
make me a roll for your spot traps. And this is just your general... Um, yeah, fine room trap, one in that's six. That's the one, yep. Yeah. I got a five. Okay, so as you head through, you don't notice any like pressure plates or anything like that, which yeah. doesn't really surprise you because like this trap's obviously magical. Yeah. You know, so like it probably doesn't have a mundane trigger. Yeah, so then I'll, I'll tie the um, cloth yep. over the front of this. Or move yourself in up to the first uh, column. Does the gate stay open while he's moving it, in? It does indeed. Cool. And in fact, I will remove that red cross from the gate since it's now open. I'll put a, a green... Now, if Brock and Weimar can get a sarcophagus lid from the nearest room, we can hopefully prop this gate, gate open. Just in case, yeah. Yeah, and leave the other two, leave the rest of the hirelings with Brock on the stair side of the gate. We have uh, like an open lid already. Did we open one of these? All those ones with the red crosses in the other room. There, we opened a chest, but I don't think we opened. You didn't open the sarcophagus. Yeah, right? the sarcophagus. That's right. that's didn't we? As well. Is yeah, this I... is this thing like an altar? Yeah, it's just basically a large stone slab atop a couple of rocks to make a really crude table. Um, so, since we're thinking about how to prop this, let, let me skedaddle. And um, I'm going to go see if I can move it with my gauntlets. Yeah, you've got gauntlets of ogre strength. That's not a problem. It's only about that thick, so even though it's like quite big... It's more sort of unwieldy than it is heavy. But mm -hmm. yeah, it's not like you're twirling a baton or anything. You just want to lift no, it and no. like drag I'm it. I'm just going to... I, I want to drag it. That's fine yeah. enough for me. Yeah, well, with, so. with your gauntlets of ogre strength, that's a piece of piss for you. Not a problem. Yeah, so I'll I'll take pretty much all of it. I'll I'll take the, the top first, of course, and yeah. then I'll bring out the stones as well. Okay, let me just just stack as in. much stuff as we can to prop it open. It doesn't need to be fully open. Just like enough for you to. Yeah, we've only got a crawl the... under, haven't we? Yeah. If we had to. That's not a problem. I'll just draw a really crude representation of the uh, the altar there, so we know that that's uh, yeah. being used to prop the door open. And that's um, only if it closes, which hopefully it yeah. won't. Anyway. Yeah. Hopefully it doesn't. It was a massive pain last time. Yeah. But these um, pillars. Sorry, what pillars? This is this a pillar down here in the? Um... It's a font, yeah. Oh, right. It's a font okay. with it's like yeah, a small yeah, hexagonal yeah. stone font with like tapid water. Oh, in it. okay, okay. Was there like holy water or something in there? You those... you didn't see any obvious signs of it being holy. Mm. There was water in there. Yeah, but well. you know, like without any sort of undead being around the present, how would you know if it was holy or not? Well. Um, Wymore is thinking is it's in the temple, gotta be holy. Um, uh, cool. Well, we've got the, the door propped up. Yep. Is everyone satisfied with this? Because I can I can try and drag more stuff here. Nah. No, I think if that doesn't hold, there's nothing else around here. It's gonna hold. Mm. Right. And so okay, well, I'm just now options are we either try and get everybody to come to us, or we go down there and present a target for. Seconds. I definitely think we need more information before we start attracting attention. I mean, we could certainly lay a trap once we know what we're dealing with. Yeah. But I think it would be good to know what we're dealing with. If we can. I'm going to get the ball out, John, and look at the uh, look for land. Okay, you you get to the the crystal ball out. I'm assuming you've not used it yet today. You can only use it no, three times a day. You 
you stare into it it's dark and cloudy and then a a sort of picture of a you think it's like the inside of a of a, a cart maybe a carriage or something like that starts to form and you see lan and this this figure that you saw previously conducting this weird ceremony that you've assumed to be like the necromancer who was layering here because you've never actually like met him in person seem to be like sat in this carriage then f as you're looking at it suddenly the image changes and in the best sort of lord of the rings imitation style a blood red burning eye forms in the crystal ball and then as the rest of you watch a a gauntleted hand dripping blood seems to lunge out of the surface of the orb towards Quentin's face. <laughs> what do you do, Quentin? You've only got a split second to react. I'm, I'm just going to drop the ball on the floor. I don't care. Okay. So as this sort of like brrr, claw comes out of his face, Quentin drops the the crystal ball to the ground. It shatters. Obviously, cross off your carrot sheet. And the... The hand, as it sort of cracks, it disperses into a cloud of mist. The hand sinks back into the mist, and then a few moments later, the mist disperses. Well, he's in a carriage with Lan, apparently. Hmm. He couldn't make out any landmarks. I didn't get a chance before that hand turned up. It may be too late. <clears throat> well, there's nothing stopping us from stomping around down there, is there? No. Mm -hmm. no so I'm I'll, gonna... I'll go and have a quick look, and then um, if you hear me scream, come running. Well, I suggest we all stand nearby the stairs anyway. Yeah, I'll, I'll be... For us to go down, uh, I've got the the sun sword, and I suppose whatever is coming up there is okay. uh, going to be enjoying that. So I'm just going to move you guys back slightly because something will happen before you get there. So I'm going to move you okay, all cool. sort of back slightly. So as you start heading down, as if in answer to the previous concerns you voiced before, Quentin stared into the crystal ball. You hear a a strange gurgling voice that sounds a little bit like the the necromancer's apprentice that you faced and thought you'd killed and in fact where you got me the crystal ball from quentin but it sounds oddly distorted and sort of burbling as though he's sort of like he's speaking through like water or he has like fluid on his lungs and you hear this voice say a trap you say oh no the trap has already been laid and as the voice says that you hear from the chambers to the north the sound of stone grinding upon stone as the stone effigies on the tombs begin to climb off their stone plinths and a march out of the doors of their chambers They look like knights, did you say? Yeah, they look like stone knights. So statues of knights, effectively. Remember, we can move around these rooms. <clears throat> and obviously you guys have got a bit of time to position yourself. I mean, they're, they're fairly slow. They're statues. So it's, uh, although one's next to Weimar on the map, it's not like it suddenly sprinted out of there and like took him by surprise. So you've got a bit of time to like manoeuvre yourselves. Yeah, should we take a defensive position in the doorway of that big room? <clears throat> I think we should. Yeah. And uh, bring our guys in as well. Yeah, so... Yeah, we'll just use Fabrio to represent where the, the hirelings are. So I don't know if me and Malcolm will sort of block the doorway from just inside. Okay, what about you, Wymo? Where are you moving to? Uh, 
Well, uh, sort of Wymore's go-to has been like uh, teaming up with Brock. <laughs> um, so I think. So are we are we talking like proper movement now, like in you know combat styling? Ooh. After you've sort of like decided on your initial positions, then we'll move into full combat. Ah, right, okay. So obviously, as the as this voice has basically been like, oh, there is a trap and it's for you, mm. and you hear this like, <laughs> you've got a bit of time to like get yourself into whatever positions you want to be. Right. Okay. Well, um, I suppose standing by there, uh, sort of tapping Brock on the the shoulder, sort of like, you got him, big you guy. Know, I, <laughs> Come on, <laughs> you you can do it. Watch Come out for that right jab. Get, get your head in the game, man. You can be a contender. That slapping the gloves on him. Like, Let you me in. Be send me back in, coach. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm adding his um, you know, protectors like, to him. Like, spraying <laughs> some water in his mouth <laughs> as he's like, gum shield. Get me the gum shield. He's got his like silk dressing gown on. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, so what I'm going to ask now is, can one of you guys roll me a d6 for your initiative? And obviously, I will roll for the enemy. There's no surprise round, obviously. I'm on a mighty six. Right, I'll roll it then. A four. Okay, so they're going first. Obviously, only two of them can get to you because of the door. So these two will march up there. And these ones will start marching up here. Do they seem pretty slow, or...? They seem to have a fairly constant pace, yeah. <laughs> okay, so these two move in here. One is going to attack Brock, one is going to attack Malcolm. I'm just going to shout out what they get. Let me know if they hit you. That one will not hit Brock. And that one will not hit Malcolm as they, they flail at you with their uh, stone swords. But as they seem to be entirely animated statues they don't appear to have the combat expertise that an actual knight of their sort of stature would have and they're sort of clumsy and uncoordinated flailing with these stone blades over to you guys I suggest the Malcolm that we sort of gang up on one and try and take him down one at a time and let's, let's see let's see if they can Ooh, take, um... take a sword and while I'm doing that, I'll suggest to Weimar and Quinton that maybe they could be flanked by archers. Um, and then I will lay into the one in front of Brock. Okay. And I shall do similar. Uh, okay, so... That is going to be a miss. miss. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you both actually strike the creature, but it seems to be made of solid stone, and despite the sparks and the the few chips of stone that go up in response to your mighty blows, it doesn't seem to concern the creature at all. Okay. Anyone else? I am moving. Okay. 30, 25's there. Mm-hmm. Um, I suppose we're going to... Yeah. Uh, Quentin is, is great with the maneuvers as... Uh, witnessed last time, uh, but I guess I'll I'll do most good trying to get there as well. So, uh, yeah, I'm not sure if my movement rate is correct on the sheet here. It does have a note on it, which I guess might have been corrupted or something. Okay, let me just have a look. And what does it say your movement is? So it, it says 25 currently, which is more than Malcolm or Brock. Yeah, I believe your movement's 15. Yeah, that's what I was thinking as well. Yeah, there we go. I've changed it. Yeah, so... Yeah, just to, I, I wanted to check, and I was very confused. Um, so uh, I'm, I guess we're running. So one, two, three. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'm following. With okay, no problems. Are any of your hirelings doing anything? 
but they'll be supporting fucking Malcolm, I think. Okay. But they're all archers, right? No, because you got the two heavy hitters in there. Oh, okay. Medium hitters. Yeah, I was going to say, calling them heavy hitters is a bit of a stretch. But um... They're heavier than me. <laughs> well, well, yeah, there I mean, is do, that. Do you want to take one of them with you, like as a shield wall in case? No, I'm taking the archers with me. Okay, so we split them, so the archers go with you and the melee okay. guys will stay with us. And if need be, I can be the shield trying to be yeah, in the yeah. front of the dark archers. So. Okay, cool. so if someone wants to roll for the the two heavy hitters, in inverted commas, taking their attacks, so that's... Uh, Are they going to be able to swing as well, yeah? Harash and okay. Gartag, yeah. All right. I'll do one if you want to do one there. Yeah, I'll do one each, yeah. Uh, okay, so that's a 12... Okay. I rolled a 16. Okay, so 12. I don't know if either of those are any good. 16. So you're... So Parash and Gartag, with their club and their long swords sort of wade into these stone statues, but like yourself, they don't appear to be able to do any great damage to them. Okay. Okay, any more for any more? Like I say, I'm bringing the range support with me, so... Okay, no problems. So, initiative again, guys. I'll roll for the the monsters. I'm on a two. I'm on it. Four, because I get a bonus. Okay, so, yeah, you guys get to go first. So, Quentin. Uh, let the fighters go first. Okay. Okay, so I will... Okay, we'll do us first, then. Uh... Rolled an 18, and my plus is plus 2, I believe. Okay, that is a hit. Okay. Uh, D10 plus 2. That is 10 damage, if it does normal damage. Okay, and it does indeed take normal damage as you shatter one of the creatures that stands in front of you. It, nice. it splits apart and falls to the ground in chunks of grey stone. I got a 15, which I guess is a miss. That's correct. Okay. Okay. So, do you want to roll for the uh, your two combat yep. guys? Yeah. Uh, my one missed. Mine too. Okay, no problems. So, Quentin, Weimar, and the... Uh, the, the elite normal human range squad. <laughs> the artillery company. That's it. <laughs> Team Bolt. Yeah, don't mind me. I'm hobbling along. So I'm going to tell you to make a two second fuse. All right, for our bombs? Yeah. Okay. Or. I guess bomb <laughs> instead of, of bombs. No, we got we... bombs. We got uh, three of them. Huh? Three. Okay. Good. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. So we'll go on to the the bad guys' turns. These three step up to the the wall here, and you hear a sickening slurping sound like someone punching wet cement, and uh, these three stone statues appear to phase through the wall as though it wasn't there okay that's the thing <clears throat> they don't actually break the wall they just sort of pass through it yeah they, they seem to move through it almost as though it's like a like quick sand and they're sort of like pushing through it you watch mm. as the the stone wall becomes almost sort of semi liquid as you see that sort of stone hands sort of emerging through it Although, obviously, they don't need to breathe or anything like that because they're statues. Perhaps some sort of enchanted affinity with stone or the stones of this tomb that they've been designed to protect allows them to do this. You're not sure. But they move through the walls, albeit it slows them down slightly, but they still march into close quarters with you. So I'm going to do two on Malcolm and a couple on Brock. So here we go. Go. I'll say I'll shout out what no doubt horrendous scores they get. 
That's at 13. That's going to be a miss on Brock. And the next one is even lower. So two of them flail at you, Brock. Don't do a damn thing. Two on Malcolm. First one misses. And the next one is an 18, which I'm assuming misses. 18 misses, yeah. Okay. So now we've got one lot attacking your your hirelings. So and it, and it is attacking discriminate indiscriminately. It's not sort of going like, oh, I must take out that guy with the big hat or like that guy with the big sword. So potentially in this group we've got Fabrio, Parash, and Gartag. So I'm gonna ask um Malcolm, can you please roll me a D four? If you get a four, just re roll it. Okay. Three. Okay, that's on Fabrio. So I'm gonna make an attack roll for him. Okay, luckily for Fabrio, somehow this giant stone creature manages to miss him, just like knocking his hat off his head. He lets out a high pitched shriek as he sort of ducks down as this thing's stone weapon like cleaves his big hat in two. But it doesn't actually cause him any harm. Okay. So we're on to initiative again, guys. I'm on a five. Three. Okay, so I'll do, they're just carrying on attacking. So I'll do the... I'm going to do two on Brock and two on Malcolm again. So the two on Brock, one misses. And one with a 20, which I'm assuming hits. Yep. Okay, so you take five hit points of damage as one of these blunt stone swords cause it's, it's literally made out of stone, it's not a proper sword it's like driven into your side with tremendous force and the two on Malcolm ok, one of those has hit and you take six hit points of damage as a stone blade smashes into your collarbone and ok one, and that's it we are done for them. So it's over to you guys. Uh, I'm going to attack the one on the map, which is uh, just below Fabio or wherever. The Highlands, basically. Uh, I assume that is a miss. Uh, 13. Unfortunately, yeah. Again, it's not a case of you're actually missing. It's just your sword striking them, but it's like they're just big lumps of stone. Like you know that as a, as an expert hunter and someone who's fought more than his share of like tribal pretenders of, if you're facing against a, a human or something that's humanoid, you know like in general like where the vital parts of the body are to go for. But when it's just a big lump of stone that's animated, no doubt by foul magics, where do you aim? Want to find a weak spot? Yeah. Um, John, I would like to. Um, I don't know if this is feasible now, but I'd like to barge my guy back a square so Fabio and the other uh, hirelings could escape out the door. So I want to move this guy, if that's possible. Okay, so I'm going to say make an attack roll, and if you manage to, if you manage to hit it, we'll say you push it back by five feet. Okay. Rather than doing damage. Right. Uh, that's another one, so I'm guessing that that's a sore head. <clears throat> yeah, you try and push it, but it, it is literally the weight of like a sort of large chunk of granite that you're just trying to. Because bad mind, you're already sort of going through the exertion to combat, and you're just suddenly trying to heave it out of the way. You're not able to move it, unfortunately. Okay, so have you got any of your um, hirelings you want to do anything with? Yeah, might as well attack. Might as well give it a go. Oh, 19. That's a hit. Ooh. Um which one which one have I got? Um so you got uh We'll say you we'll say you've got Parash and then we'll say Malcolm's got Gartag, so Parash is armed with a club which would be D six. D six, yeah. Yeah. Uh four that is. I okay, so he smashes his club and which one was it they're attacking? The one below Fabio on the on the map. Okay, so I'm going to put it onto its side just to show it's wounded as a large chunk of it is chipped off. 
can Fabio himself do that, or is he just a no? Fa- Fabio is a complete non-combatant. Okay. Can he escape? Can he run? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. That's fine. So and obviously, you we'll have him run after Weimar. Okay. And obviously, you've still got your guy. I'll, I'll move. Fabio. Oh my guy missed. Sorry, I, I oh, rolled okay, from no please. Yeah, I'll, I'll, move, I'll move Fabio towards Weimar. We'll just remember that the combat guys are with you, you lot. Okay. Okay. So, Weimar and Quentin? Going there. Okay. And shoot at this one. Okay. Wondering where they've all fucking gone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you sort of burst around the corner expecting to see about four or five lined up for you. And there's just one, yep. like, fighting in the gateway. <laughs> so, eight is going to miss. Yeah. Obviously, you've still got your, uh, your yeah, we'll get them two guys to fire with something off as well. Okay, not a problem. So, roll, because they're effectively normal humans. They don't get any modifier to their attack roll. Yep. Well, they get a minus one modifier to their attack roll, so... So one got a five and one got a four, so they're useless. Yeah, so a couple of bolts get fired off, but they either bounce off or don't hit the, the creature. They probably hit the um, post in front of me. <laughs> yeah, probably. Okay, one more. <laughs> Following along. So... Yep. Okay. That's me. On to the next round, so it's initiative again. I'm on a six. We're on six. Okay, so we're all going simultaneously. So if you guys want to go first, and I'll do mine afterwards, but obviously any you kill this round will also get to attack. Start with myself. I miss horribly okay. once again. None of us seem to be doing very well with the dice rolls this session. <laughs> oh, ter- 20. Oh, that, 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 which, which one are you attacking? Uh, the one in the doorway. Okay. This one here. Um, let's work out what damage this sword does. Uh, okay, so 1d8 plus 1. Uh, so that is 8 points of damage on that one. Okay, so you hack a massive chunk out of the one in the gate. However, it is still just about standing. Okay, obviously you guys have each got your your man oh, arms missed. with you. Yep. Okay, so Prash you missed. misses. Uh, Nineteen for Gartag. That is a, a hit. Perfect. I'm a, I'm assuming okay. he's attacking the same one as you. No, I think he's he's because I think he's where Dario was. So he's attacking yep. that one. Um, that well, yeah, no Brock hit. Um, what does he have? It's a D6, uh, I'm guessing, right? Yeah, it will be a D6, yeah. Uh, six points of damage. Okay, that, that is enough to take out one of the the stone creatures. So, Gartag wades in, swinging his longsword at the already staggered stone creature that Brock's been wailing into. And he reduces it to so much stone dust and fine grey powder. Nice. There are only three remaining. Okay, so have you guys all gone this turn? No, I'm going to shoot the one in the doorway again. Okay, yeah. I've got 20 to hit. Yeah, I'll do it. Three points of damage. Okay, that has killed the the one in the doorway. Obviously, we'll still get to attack this turn as will the other one, because it's all happening simultaneously. I should have left the other one there, but I forgot. Okay, so on to the bad guy's turn. So we're going to do two against Brock because the one I've removed is still there because it's all simultaneous, and then we'll do two on Malcolm as well. So. First one on Brock misses. Second one on Brock, that's a 17. I'm guessing that's probably a miss. Uh, 18, I am. Okay, so none of them hit you. And two on Malcolm. That one misses. And the second one misses. 
So I'll, I'll momentarily make that one massive before I dilute it. There we go. Okay, so after that sort of mass confusion and you all going at the same time and blows of stone swords, crossbow bolts flying down corridors, men at arms wading in with long swords, as the dust starts clearing and you all catch your breath before the next round, you can see that only two of these stone sort of tomb guardians remain. And we're back onto initiative. Hmm. I'm on a three. And if that was you rolling for initiative, Quentin, you're on three as well. He plus four, he is plus one. All right, okay, so yeah, you guys go first then. Okay, so I will swing at the one in front of Brock. Okay, just swing at the same one. Uh, 16, that's not enough, is it? That is a miss, your sword clangs off its stony hide. And it rhymes at mine, clanging off it on the Indeed. other side. There's two loud, like, clang, clang. As you wail at this thing with your weapons, but don't seem to find a purchase. Obviously, you still got your two men at arms as well. Oh no, sorry, John, that's nineteen. I didn't include all oh, my in which case, you, in which case you would have hit. So, right. Yeah, sorry. That's all right, it's mate. Plus five. Oh, twelve damage. <laughs> okay, so describe to us how you like literally with one mighty blow annihilate to one of these creatures uh so i've been chipping away at the sort of neck of this 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 stone statue and then um i muster up enough strength and almost like fell in a tree hit into this where i've already put a, a small dent or a, a, a cut and it just cracks across the head and the head just topples backwards and followed by the rest of the body nice and indeed that is what happens there is a loud rumble akin to that of distant thunder as this stone statue now devoid of its animated force and its head topples to the floor with a mighty crumbling and crashing sending stone chips and dust billowing out briefly through the room leaving only one remaining um, so Gartag has hit us Okay. Uh, for five points of damage. Okay, so Gartag got swinging his longsword. An 18, is that enough or it not? It is, yeah. Oh. Uh, it's only two for me. Okay, so Parash with his club and Gartag with his longsword are both wailing on this stone statue, but it's despite the fact it's now missing great chunks out of it and there's dust cascading out of the broken bits of it, the, the animating force that's forcing it to keep fighting still seems to continue to press it ever onwards. Okay, Quentin and Wamo. But there's nothing to shoot at without hitting one of those guys, so um, I think we'll just go and... Supervise. Yeah. I'm going to watch. Okay. Walk through the wall. Seems fairly simple. Okay, so why am I? What are you up to? Uh, I guess I'm following Quentin. Okay. So I'm going to have the the creature, the stone creature, attack your two hirelings because they did the most damage to it in the turn. It only makes sense. So let's see which of them it attacks. So it's attacking Parash. Roll to hit. Okay, eight. Eight. Let me just check his stats. And oh, no, that's bonuses on. Okay, so Parash takes the blow on his chainmail, raising his shield at the last second. A shield cracks and you hear the splintering of wood, but it holds and he resists the blow. So sort of pushing the stone sword back. And it wow. does not damage him. We're on to initiative again, guys. I'm on two.
Mm -hmm. So as well. Okay, so if you guys want to go first, obviously it's happening simultaneously, though. Uh, 18. That was a hit, wasn't it? Yep. Uh, that is nine damage. Okay, so that is enough to kill it. So effectively, Ra, there's, there's not much point in having you guys wail on a creature that's already dead. So what I'm going to do is, if you guys are all right with it, I'm just going to jump to its attack. Because obviously with it going simultaneously with you, it's going to attack the hirelings again. Because at the time it attacks, you've not done your damage to it yet, Brock. Okay. So I'm just going to do its attack. So let's see which one of the hirelings it attacks. It's going for Gartag this time. That's wrong. It's... Okay. And Gartag again blocks with his shield and sort of pushes it back as it does brock brings the hammer down reducing this barrow guardian to so much stone fragments and they're all gone we're out of combat rounds mm. as the dust starts to settle i shall congratulate the two men at arms on their yeah, worthy that, show that that's sort of gartag and uh Parash are sort of like clapping each other on the back. Uh, you notice uh, Parash starts to like get out his like little book and he he starts like patting around as though he's like looking for his ink pot. And then Gartag like laughs and he's like he's like look you can write down whatever you want to later we haven't really got time at the minute and he's like oh yeah I suppose you're right and he just like, tucks the booklet away and then you you're sort of like patting him on the back Brock and congratulating them which. They seem pretty pleased about, you know, it was like their first sort of outlet as like your henchmen. And obviously they were sort of wading in like side by side with you and they got to like finish off a couple of creatures themselves. That seems to have sort of like spurred their resolve. You notice any of you are sort of able combatants, which is down to you whether you notice this or not. You would probably notice that when they first went into the combat, they were like a little bit nervous. These are sort of like strange enchanted creatures. They're not adventurers. They've probably not come across this before. You know, they may be used to like brigands, maybe the odd like sort of goblin or two, not like giant animated statues of knights. But as the combat went on and they saw you guys sort of reinforcing them and helping them take the down and they got a few blows themselves, that seemed to sort of steal their resolve. And by the end of the combat, they're becoming like noticeably more sure of themselves and more sure with their strikes that they were laying down on these stone beasts yeah okay cool. we're now out of combat round so it's over to you guys again are these um all these knights come out of these sarcophagus to yeah. the north yeah that's correct are they all still open i take it the, the sarcophaguses themselves aren't actually open as you can see from the map right. there's like stone sort of effigies depicted on the lids it was those stone effigies that got up so they just rised up rather yeah. than come out of them yeah okay. it wasn't so much it's like are oh, the undead occupants of the of the tomb sort of rising up it was more like the stone statues on top of the tombs were enchanted to like protect the okay. tomb. okay hmm. obviously Trap failed whatever else there is in the tomb you guys don't know so yeah quentin you say out loud you're like your trap failed and again you with this voice that seems to echo through the corridors this strangely distorted voice of the necromancer's apprentice say perhaps well then brave heroes step into my master's lair and face me if you have the courage the time for games has ended Yeah, well, I'm up for that. Okay, so what's the plan, guys? I'm assuming his lair is down those stairs. It was last time. Did we? Do we actually get anyone to go down there and have a look? Nope. No. No. No, the zombies came. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'll go and have a quick look. See now, then, shall I? Well, yeah, we'll st we'll stand nearby, obviously, in case you have any okay. issues. So, I'm going to put all your your counters on here, and I want you like Quentin's down there at the moment. But uh, you know, I'll just make it a bit 
easier later on. And whilst why not go into the navigator? I must have found the big hat for a uh, tagline. There we go. Okay, so you walk down a stone flight of stairs and you see um, an empty portcullis that yawns ahead of you. And as you peer through it, you see beyond a corridor that appears lit by the same sorcerous stone uh, sort of mounted torches that you saw previously. Is Hot. there any of those schools on these pillars? All of the pillars have stone schools inscribed on them. However, you see in the in the archway in front of you, there's no like portcullis, and it's just an empty stone archway. Okay. Oh, okay. Hopefully, better. I shall go to there and look down this corridor. Okay. You peer down that corridor. seem to have wanted to uh, <laughs> and to, there's nothing there to, yeah, the <laughs> darkness is all you can see <laughs> okay, I'm not sure what's going on there. let me try again there we go don't know why I didn't seem to want to cut the fog of war out there you peer down the corridor there is some chipped statue tree and you can see entrances to other chambers all of which have wooden doors in them surprisingly well maintained like the level above there are three chambers on the northern side of the corridor and there are two chambers on the southern side. You notice, however, from under this door here, there's like a small gap under it and what appears to be faint wisps of like a luminous green smoke seem to just like be eking out under this doorway. Let's make that um, a wee bit more artistic, not much, but there we go. Is that a door above me? It is, yeah. I will gently slide it open with the back of my hand. Okay. You start to try and slide the door open, and it is locked. From in, from just beyond the door, you hear a... Uh, uh. Okay, I shall go back. Right, we've got one room with green smoke. I assume that's where the twat is. There's... Um, a door just around the corner. There appears to be a groaning coming from inside of it. It's either a zombie or somebody locked up, I would imagine. You think you could be able to get the door open? I'd have to pick the lock, which means the mist is going to be quite close. Oh, is it continuously seeping out? It, it's it? not It's yeah. not filling up the... It is continually seeping out, but it's just like a, a few wisps. It's not filling up the corridor. It's sort of dispersing when it gets maybe like five, six foot away from the door. So it's not getting but, worse, particularly. As it's magic, you know. It's yeah, one I mean, of the... you, you never know. Hmm. That's very true. So uh, if you want to stay around the corner, I'll go and try and pick a lock, but... I'm just wondering if it is someone that's been captured, they may be able to assist us in, um, you know, how we can defeat this guy easier. All right, give me a minute. I shall pick the lock, John. Well, I'll okay. try to pick the lock. Make your lock pick roll. As soon as I find it, I will do. Mm hmm.
65 percent chance Eighty-two. Okay, so you've not managed to pick the lock. Okay, so you try and pick the lock. You're not having any luck with it, but however you're, you're sort of jostling and tinkering around with it. You hear from inside the chamber, like, "Is is there somebody there? But please, help help me." Give me a minute. Okay, now if you want to spend, because you've already failed the roll, you yep. can you can try and pick it, and you will eventually pick it, but it's going to take a fair old amount of time. Yeah, I'll give it another go. If it's not working, I'm just going to leave well, like one say, of these. Like I say, you won't be able to make another roll, but you, you can just do yep. it, but it will take a large amount of time. It's whether you yeah, spend I'll, that time doing it. I'll spend the time. There's nothing happening at the minute. Okay, so... As Quentin's sort of like jangling around this lock, which is obviously taking like, it's probably taking about 10 minutes already. Yeah, once this took five minutes, I'm going to come down to that corner to just check what's going on. Okay. Yeah, you, bit... you peer around, you see Quentin's got his tools out, he's like working on the lock. And obviously you hear that groan that like, please help me coming from the room. Yeah, I'll just keep an eye on him while he's concentrating on the lock. Like. Okay, not a problem. What are the rest of you doing while that's going on? Because like, obviously you've got 10 minutes. I'll creep down as well and stay about 10 foot behind Brock. Okay. Yeah. Uh, super awkwardly standing guard slash just waiting. Okay. I'll move sort of Fabrio down there. Okay, so as you're working on the lock, Quentin, again you hear this, you hear this voice sort of drifting on the air, although it sounds somehow louder, maybe closer now. And the voice says, "My master knew you would return, seeking the woman using the orb that you stole from me, but the orb was gifted to my master by his crimson lord, and he only shows you what the sanguine king wants you to see. You are too late." My master has taken your woman to be his lord's blood-red queen, but he has rebuilt me and made me stronger that I might properly welcome you to his home. And as the voice says that, it tapers off into this mocking laughter. The door sort of here bulges outwards and then shatters as from inside that room a horrendous grotesque giant figure that seems like a madman took a bunch of charred zombie corpses vermin and the remnants of the mad necromancer's apprentice and melded them together into some unwholesome and abominable form of unlife bursts through the doorway flailing around with multiple limbs and screaming from multiple rat and human faces. The wall it bursts through is pretty much destroyed. So that's this wall here is pretty much gone, which I know it's not much of an upside at the moment, but um, it does let you see into the chamber beyond. I'm gonna during the last combat, Wymar gave me a two second fuse and a one of the grenades we've got. Yep. So I'm gonna obviously light the fuse while it's moving backwards and yep. then just throw it uh about two squares in front of him. Okay, make a ranged attack roll. Nineteen. Okay. Yep, so you want to put it sort of about here-ish, is that right? Yeah, about there. <clears throat> okay, so... And then I'm going to vanish around this corner. Okay, no problems. <laughs> Whilst so... telling them all to stay back. <laughs> okay, so basically that will go off next round, effectively. Yeah. Okay, but he's so... going to get a nice load of ball bearings on his backside. <laughs> so, since it burst out, everyone but you, but you, Quentin, will definitely be surprised. However, you were near enough, so can you roll me a d6... 
if you get a one, you're surprised. So basically, it'll have got to move. Three. Okay, so yeah, you're fine. So you throw the bomb where you are. It's basically like running down this corridor towards you, and it's like multiple legs and arms which seem to function interchangeably as limbs to which attack and to apply motive force to itself as it sort of scuttles down the corridor. And like I say, this thing's easily about 14 feet tall, multiple limbs, head screaming. It seems to like roll and roil like a, just a mass of flesh that's fused together as it moves down this corridor. Then we're on to initiative. Is this the same voice yeah. that's been talking to us? Yeah, yeah. Indeed. And you recognise the central head of this creature seems to be that of the Necromancer's Apprentice. I am on six. Who wants to roll? I can yeah, you do it. I have terrible luck. Uh, two. I think I have plus one, so three. Okay, so it's going first. Before it gets to go, your bomb will go off. So, Quentin, roll me a d12. Uh, two. Nine. Okay, so as it moves past, this bomb explodes and like a large portion of it just gets shredded and burnt off it's difficult to tell exactly how much damage it's done to it because like I say it looks like all these bodies sort of melded together by a madman okay and it is going to continue its move for its round let's see. Let's see. it's going to move here with its reach it'll be able to hit two of you so i'm going to roll to see who it attacks it's got two attacks so one and two it's brock three four it's weimar five six it's quentin so first one weimar second one quentin okay so the first one on weimar as uh, like what seem like hundreds of hands clutching stones bits of bone, wood, just all flail out it like a wave of uncoordinated limbs. That's a 15, which I'm guessing doesn't hit you. That's a negatory, yep. Okay, so I'm Quentin. And that is even less, so that doesn't hit you. Woohoo! Okay, that's the creature done. Over to you guys. Yeah, I shall charge in. Sword slashing at this creature go for it uh, oh that's a miss I should imagine that's a 9 yes it is yeah. I'm going to take a step back behind this pillar and obviously shoot it yeah that's absolutely fine you can see so as you're obviously you're accustomed to working out these this sort of like tactical way of things you can see it basically appears to have like a 10 foot reach because yeah. it, its, its arms are made of like multiple arms sort of like somehow yeah. attached together yeah so I got 11 to hit okay that doesn't hit it unfortunately well, or more likely your bolt does hit it but it just hits like a flashy bit and like sinks into the amorphous mass that makes of its horrendous body you might want to take one more step back if it's I can't tell how far away it is it's I'm just on the edge of its reach yeah oh, okay I'll uh, charge in as well. Okay. So go for. Uh, that's a miss. Okay. Don't forget you've got your uh, your uh, okay. backup I'll guys. For... What do you want to go first, Wimmer? Um, I guess so. Use the sun sword. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. So, John, is this undead? It is indeed. I see that. Um, okay, so I need to do a, a brief bit of calculus here. Uh, and then, because I've got the gauntlets now, it's it's yep. giving me some bonuses here. So we're at, uh, and then it's undead. So so that's cool. Um, 
20? Uh, yeah, that'll do. And then... Okay, so it's 1d8. Okay. Uh, that'll be uh, 8. Okay. Yeah, so your sun sword cleaves huge, now hissing and superheated chunks of undead flesh from the, the sort of internal scaffolding of this horrendous creature. And they fall to the ground, still sizzling. Obviously, the ha. Ah. Oh yeah, of course, yeah. The uh, <laughs> the, the choir. Yeah, you get the ah, and the the sort of corridors now filled with the, the light of a thousand suns. Just roll for the old hyalin I've got here. Okay. He's got a sixteen. That is a hit. Oh. Uh, and a six damage. Okay, so yeah, so Parash wades in, sort of smashing to a pulp several of the, the flailing limbs that are getting near him. Yeah, Garatag misses. Okay. Do you want to shoot with any of your man at arms? Yeah, Quentin? they're all going to shoot, I think. Okay, don't forget they all get a minus one to their, their attack. Yeah. Such uh, a plebs. 13 for one. Misses. Um. A 14 for the up. Misses. Okay. So, on to the creature, I believe, if you've all gone. Okay, so since it hasn't moved this round, it can do all its attacks, which is basically like attacking anyone within range. It's got like a million arms. So... I'm going to do its first attack on Brock, which is over 20, so that will hit. So it roll its damage. You take 15 hit points of damage as these multitude of arms like flail at you, beating you with stones and clubs from seemingly every angle. Mm -hmm. Okay, the one on Malcolm. That misses the one on Weimar. Misses on Quentin, who's just within range. Misses on Parash. Hits. Yeah, Parash just gets annihilated by these like dozen or so fists that just like smash him into a wall and like. Repeatedly, like, bang his head into the walls of the stone corridor, and Prash falls down as a sort of bloody sack of pulped organs. Okay, attack on Gartag. Misses. An attack on the, the two torchbearers, so Cargos hits. Yep, Cargos is also taken down. And then Talon. Talon is also taken down. So both of your your torchbearers slash missile troops are down and only Gartag remains of your man at arms. That saves on wages. Well yeah, there is that. Okay, next round initiative. I'm on six. I got six. Okay, so you guys go first. Alright. Uh, take another swing. Oh, that's a hit this time. Okay. Uh, that is seven damage. Okay. You, are you using your spear or weapon are you using? Uh, me two-handed sword. Okay, you wade into this thing and you hack several more like bloody chunks off it. The thing's now starting to look a little bit sorry for itself. There's, its attacks are a little bit slower and more sluggish and uncoordinated as though the whatever gestalt intelligence or evil magics is that is animating it is slowly unravelling before the ferocity of your assault. Okay, who's next? I've hit it for four points of damage as well. Okay, no problems. 
Okay, following Brock's example, Malcolm cleaves into it as well. Take a step backward and shoot it. Go for it. I got 17. That is a hit. And did three points of damage. Okay, still just about going. I'll go roll for guard tag then. Okay. Uh, 17. That is a hit. For four points of damage. Okay, this thing is only just about holding itself together now. It seems to have very little left in it. Most of it's lying strewn around the corridor in a mess of bloody chunks. So this There's is where Fabio shoots out of nowhere. To do the damage. <laughs> That's it. Why more? Yeah. For the finisher. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Stealing the glory. That's it. Um, they okay. got him the closer. Because <laughs> he closes deals. Let's see. Well, we close today. Um, it's going to be like 25. And then we're looking at uh, 11. Okay. Describe how you close the deal. Uh, so how tall was this construction? Okay. So initially it was about 14 foot tall and basically someone... It, it, it almost was a bit reminiscent of like the thing from John Carpenter's The Thing, uh, you know, when like it goes into the form where it's like looking like everything it's sort of assimilated. But in this case, it was like someone had just like mashed a load of like pot burned and sort of chopped up zombies together with the remains of his assistant, which seemed to be like the guiding motivating force, and like several of the giant rat bodies and just sort of mashed them all together into this huge leviathan of flailing limbs and amorphous flesh. So, uh, with with that, uh, I guess I'll also just like rush in, and I'll <laughs> oh shield in front. I'll just like body slam into it, and the, uh, just stack the the sword on top of the ring with the shield, and just like press forward against it. And it's just like saw, like it was uh, <laughs> like a piece of kebab meat that I'm sawing in half. Indeed, unless you. As you saw through its already sort of bruised and cut flesh, smelling the the scent of rot and sort of burning in the air around you, as you finish this creature, you find yourself face to face with the undead and almost insane face of the the necromancer's apprentice that seemed to form the sort of guiding overall animus for this creature. And as you hack through its madly grinning and cackling face, its last words are like, Too late! Too late! And then you... <coughs> and it falls to the ground in a hissing, sizzling pile of now truly dead meat. So given that I've just roasted, like, endless pounds of rotting meat, <laughs> I guess in the immediate aftermath, Weimar's like... <laughs> Yeah, th th this <laughs> corridor does smell pretty rank now, I'm not going to lie. It's definitely on the gippy side. As there's all this like, already rotten meat lying around. Some of it now like singed and like, congealed blood coating the, the floor of the corridor. What do you guys do? Just going to casually on? step over the mess and go back to that door. Okay, eventually you you pop the lock on the the chamber and you see beyond a a small what looks like stone prison cell crouched against the far end of the chamber is a ragged figure wearing what appears to be little more than rags. He has a sort of mad look on his face. He's stained with blood and no doubt his own waste there is a couple of metal bowls on the floor half encrusted with like semi gelatinous gruel you can see there are like chains on the hands and feet of this poor obviously malnourished prisoner he sort of he makes to try and sort of move himself away from the 
the door as you sort of pop the door open but he's he's, I mean, he's obviously like terrified almost out of his wits but he's so weak from lack of nourishment that he is little more than sort of slide himself a little bit backwards on his backside okay well I'll leave that to the big guys and move on to the next door okay no problem you head to the next door you can make a lock pick for that if you wish yep success okay so this one yields much easier to your tender lock picking administrations and you pop it open to see a fairly similar looking cell this one also has a prisoner in it although they don't appear to have been there for quite so long you can see what appears to be a a, a young man so in his early 20s he's looking a bit malnourished but nowhere like the fellow in the the chamber to the right of him he's also chained up there's a couple of bowls of gruel lying ground however when you open this door he sort of like stands defiantly to his feet and you can see he's obviously trying to like loop the sort of like chain as though he's like getting ready to like go at whoever comes through the door but then he sort of like stops when he sees it's obviously not who he was expecting calm down he says oh, i'm uh, I'm sorry, I, I haven't eaten in three days. Uh, I'm expecting it to be the, the acolytes of the, the foul necromancer who lairs in this place. There was a... No, we just killed that. He nods and you see like a faint flicker of a smile. He said, there were once uh, myself and three of my companions in this cell. One by one, the others were taken and I, I heard their screams as the necromancer did whatever foul experimentation he did on them. I, I feared that I was to be next. Okay, but there's help coming. You just stay there whilst I move on to the next one. He nods. Is this a statue? Yep. It appears to be, a, it appears to be a statue of a small dog. Okay, I'm going to step over it. Yep, that's absolutely fine. You step over it. And then try my luck on this door. Okay, go for it. That's a fail. Okay, so you will get it open, but it will take you a, a short while. So whilst yep. Quentin's doing that, what are the rest of you guys doing? Um, I'm going to try and break the chains of these prisoners. Yeah, for, um... someone, for someone in your strength, that, that's not, and you've got a bit of time. That's not a problem. Yeah, leverage it and stuff. Yeah. Who do you go to first? The the crazed sort of starved man who I've represented with the, the sack token or the... No, nah, the second one. Okay, the, the warrior. Yeah. Okay, so you head in, you 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 start sort of snapping his uh, chains and he's obviously very grateful. When you finally snap them open, you see him sort of like stretching his fingers and sort of like cracking his knuckles and he, he offers you the traditional sort of warrior's handshake so beloved of uh, film and TV and then he says ah uh, oh, thank you my friend I, it is only a it is only a shame that uh, you did not come sooner perhaps you could have saved my the other members of my party I fear that uh, your intervention has come too late for them and I'll ask him did you see a woman he says uh he says, I did not see a woman, but um, two days ago I did hear the the voice of the necromancer. He was walking down this, this corridor, and he points to the corridor outside, past, uh, past my cell, and he was, uh, he was talking to a woman. I couldn't make out what they said through the, uh, through the doors, but uh, it was definitely a woman's voice. Hmm. Did, she, did she sound... Um... Did she sound uh, tearful? Did she sound distressed, scared? No, not at all. In fact, I, I distinctly recall hearing her laugh at one point. Hmm. It sounds like not the person I was looking for. Um, and I just, you know, I just, I just ask him how long he's been there, and just general sort of. 
he, he, he tells yeah. you that um, he was part of an adventuring uh, party known as the Wyvern Stink, who they they came to this island like many others have done, hope, uh, probably the best part of like a couple of weeks ago, hoping to make their fortune. The, the route he describes sort of entering the moor is a little different to the one you took, but they found the way to the church the same as you. Um, they were sort of like, they were rendered unconscious and like one of his party was slain by the creatures guarding it. The rest of them were captured in their sort of weakened state. They awoke in this prison cell, himself and like three of his companions, and sort of one by one the others were taken and he heard their screams. Like the sort of robed acolytes of the necromancer would come in, drag them out, and they were... They were too weak and injured, especially when they were only fed on this like watery gruel to like, put up much resistance. And they'd hear the screams as they were taken off. And as he said to Quentin when he first came in, he sort of thought when the door opened, like, you know, his time had come and he was to be next. Did he find anything else of significance before they were sort of captured? He, he said, uh, he said we, we found a few interesting items, but all of our, all of our equipment, uh, all of any treasures we found must have been taken from us when we were unconscious uh, w when I woke up I was as much as you see me now when I was in chains and he sort of looks at like the metal like rings that are still on his like wrist although you've broken the chain in between them hmm. okay oh yeah I mean I'll give him a bit of water and a bit of food while he's he, he eagerly accepts together. the water and you can see that like he's he's obviously at some point he was like quite a sort of proficient like warrior he's got the build of it and you can tell by his movements being a warrior yourself but he's currently in like a very weakened state like I say he's he's got injuries that like haven't been dealt with properly I and mean, he's not in any immediate danger of falling dead but he's also like malnourished so he's in, yeah. a, he's in a fairly sort of bad way he's not gonna like take two steps and drop dead or whatever but you wouldn't like to like put him in a fight at the moment till he's at least got a bit of rest and recovery yeah um yeah While that's going on, I'd have rescued the older prisoner or the Okay. You, he you head in there to this um distraught distraught half insane sort of scrawny figure and again with a bit of time you, you break his chains and he seems he seems almost half mad perhaps with the isolation of the malnourishment or the, the constant sort of fretting about his fate. <laughs> All you're able to get out of him in between this sort of like his mad ravings are that he was once a he was once a fisherman, and um, he went to answer like the call of someone in a boat who appeared to be in distress, and then like a group of hooded figures jumped him. Um, him and his like five sort of fishing companions, they they all woke up in this um, thing, and rather like the the warrior next door, all of his five companions have been like taken away, and he's not seen them again. He's just like heard the screams. He seems he, he's obviously not a proficient combatant, like I say, he's just like a fisherman, but he's like half starved and he's like terrified almost out of his wits. As he's just been like in this sort of unholy place listening to the screams of his dying fellows for like Lord only knows how long. Yeah, I'll just give him a bit of food and some water as well and just Yeah. Console him for a while. Yeah, eagerly sort of chows down on that. Okay, Wymore, what are you doing? I suppose I've taken a look around to check if there is any, perhaps any statues hidden anywhere around here in the corridor. Robbie D6. Three. You don't notice anything that's uh, hidden or otherwise concealed, it's just these... Uh, stone pillars with these skulls carved in them and as you start walking down the corridor again you can see this green sort of vapor seeping out from under the door to the south i'll remove the x because the bomb's gone now there we go and like i say this wall to the south sort of here mm -hmm. has just been like annihilated entirely and as you're sort of as you're sort of peering into it you can see what appears to be a almost like a dissection room there's like a large sort of stone table in the center of the room there's like butchers or like surgical tools dotted around most parts of the room appear to be like stained with blood and viscera there's the odd sort of like bit of flesh or like odd bit of organ sort of clinging to 
some of these surfaces in the room but beyond that unpleasant foulness it seems to be pretty much devoid of anything else of interest uh, I suppose I'll, I'll I'll ponder this workshop uh, and uh, and uh, watch uh, Quentin do his thing okay so Quentin eventually you do manage to pop the lock on the chamber to the north and it opens to reveal what appears to be a storeroom of sorts there are numerous sort of jars and boxes in here there's an odd smell of sort of a lot of chemically or sort of like spicy sort of smell lingering in the air there's also a sort of slight, slight acrid sort of like lingering smell like that of vinegar clinging in the air of this storeroom. What do you want to do? Go into this room. Okay, you head into the dissection chamber to the south. Is this a, a chest? It's not. It's just a table, with the table. with the, like, the sort of butcher's tools lying on top of it. You, What's these green you, things? It's just a. It appears to be just light emanating from the table. Perhaps some form of minor enchantment. Um, the the only thing that strikes you as odd and slightly disgusting is there's a set of pliers on the, like bloodstained pliers on the table, and lying next to it is like a single human tooth. Right then, so everybody into the green mist room, I guess. Okay. Are you going to try and pick the lock to get in there? Well, first I'm going to stand here okay. and try and push the door, see if it's... Okay, you push the door, it swings open. Okay, well... And it swings open to reveal what appears to be a study of sorts. There is a writing desk, again lit by the strange sort of uh, surface illumination, like the table in the, the dissection room. There are a number of books and sort of odd-looking apparatus scattered around that you, you don't recognise. There is also a green sort of glowing glyph or circle on the in the northeast corner inscribed on the floor and it seems to be that from which this this green mist is slowly seeping out of okay. right guys i strongly suggest that one of us stays out here malcolm there's books in here i'm sure you'll want to have a quick gander yeah. right, right, we got I this can, i can stay outside and we still got this fabio guy <laughs> He's, like, he's over there, he's still cowering. And this, so, and this is sort of thing. Well, we want to have a look at the books before we go offering them to random strangers. Oh, no, I mean, he can go and investigate this weird green sh stuff. Yeah, well, make sure it's safe first. Okay. So, if anyone wants to go in to check, maybe we'll give you a rope and... Uh drag you back if you pass out or something yeah let's go with that cool will i go quinton or do you want to go first i'm really not fussed there's a glowing green circle in there okay i'll go and have a look at the books and whatever else okay you wade through the smoke so feel free to move yourself in you do feel slightly light-headed at first but apart from that it doesn't seem to have uh, any other untoward effects you you stagger forward there's like loads and loads of books probably more books than you've ever seen you sort of ruffle through them looking for just any that stand out just having a quick look at the front the, the first one that comes to your hand is torn it's a uh, pretty badly stained seems to be missing some pages and as you turn up the the cover appears to be mostly ripped off you flip through to the, the, the front page, effectively. 
and the you finally read the title of it and it says the lusty argonian mage a classic tamriel tale of a lusty lizard folk maid okay and if i open it does it read the same as the title yep pretty much okay. it appears to be a, a fairly sort of racy sort of tale about uh someone falling for this uh the, the sad lusty lizard man mage and it seems basically a a sort of a, a fairy tale about you know like love triumphing over sort of societal barriers and species barriers okay right so i'll keep having a look through and see if there's any more interesting ones okay you find a second book torn stained it appears to be slightly burnt on one side most of the book is illegible or it's written in common speech as you're sort of flicking through it it appears to be unfinished and like ends abruptly after a few chapters and as you flick through it it seems to be almost like a, a sort of guide book or like a, a sort of early travel book and it's entitled amazing annals from the great desert stories of peril and it appears to sort of chart the the expedition of a company to a, a southern land that you're not familiar with, which is the titular Great Desert, and the various creatures and sort of strange people they encountered on the way. Although much of it seems almost too fantastic to be true. Okay. Cool, and is there any other books in old, or is that kind of it? Okay, you... You flick through most of the other books don't appear to be of great interest they're full of like mathematical formula and stuff that like you don't understand in strange languages however you do find one which appears to be a fairly recently written tome and it's called the white chronicles and at first you're like, well that's a bit of a weird title you flick through it and this appears to be a book discussing the topic of vampires okay one thing welcome Sorry, make sure you look at so make, make sure you check all them books out with the glasses on as well okay do i have the glasses Can I... yeah okay they, they, don't, so, they don't appear to be magical okay uh, but while I have the glasses on, can I have a look around the room and see if anything else is? Yeah, the, the signal that's got the mist coming from is magical. Although it's a fairly faint, sort of constant like, magic. Okay. One last thing that does strike you as on about this last book about vampires is you note that it has a, a sort of stamp or a, or a seal on it, which you would recognise as belonging to the Church of Leander, which is classifying this as an outlawed or heretical text which might explain some of the slight charring on it okay and you're you're sort of looking through it and you're like oh yeah you know the, the you've never exactly been a fan of the church of leander but you know it's a it's some sort of evil book about vampires so you could probably understand why they're banning it and then you you haven't sort of run your hand over the the leather of the cover and it strikes you as it has a bit of an odd feel to it and then as you turn the book over you see that in the sort of necronomicon style there is a squashed and distorted face sort of on the back of the cover as though it's been made out of like flayed skin and the face is that of an elf this book would appear to have been bound in elf skin okay lovely um so I took it away because they mentioned the Crimson Lord, and I guess we've history with these vampires. Mm -hmm. um, and is there anything else in the room? Is what the next thing is? This all part the same? Okay, yeah. You you look around in the room. You don't find anything else of particular interest. Okay, and if I, I look at this seal okay. that the smoke is coming from, what's it's it's not in any language that you recognize obviously not really being a, a sort of arcane practitioner um the the sort of constant sort of a magical essence that lingers around it when you view it through the lenses 
appears to be slight as though like it's sort of dormant or not active and as you say the only thing that gives it away is these these few sort of wisps of green smoke that appear to be like drifting out of it but they don't seem to be like causing any harm i mean you've just walked through them and it's not done you any damage okay you think perhaps with what limited knowledge you had perhaps this was part of like, a, like i don't know like a summoning circle or like part of like greater magics but it has to be like activated to like contribute power to some sort of greater working but obviously at the moment it's just sort of like on standby mode effectively okay and is it etched onto the floor or is it yeah it's, or it's is carved it... into the into the wooden floor and like I say okay. each, each sort of groove it appears to have this like this luminous glow sort of coming from it okay um so if i um see when i have some sort of hatchet or something um can i break the floor to break the seal yep you you sort of hack away at the floorboards there doesn't appear to be any sort of special protection and as you sort of rip up the floorboards that make up this seal it indeed so the light fades from it and the smoke quickly disperses so i'll put a uh, put a red cross on the seal so that we know it's no longer active okay okay um so i'll just call out to the others it looks like they took anything of value when they left um but i did find a book on vampires Okay, what's the plan now, guys? I'm going to check the storeroom for anything of note, any provisions. Okay, uh, no problem. You find the the smell of sort of vinegar is emanating from a number of jars that appear to contain body parts, mostly human, pickled in vinegar. There are a number of boxes containing like bones that are, seem to be entirely clean of f flesh. And there are some urns containing like, herbs that you're not familiar with. However, as you continue to poke around, you do find four vials of liquid, which don't have labels on them, but they're in sort of like potion bottles. Okay, well, I'll, uh, I'll show them to the others. Say so these might be of something of, of interest if we can identify. What color is the liquid? Okay, one of them is white, one of them is pale blue, one of them is a pearlescent colour, and the other is a sort of, I suppose like a fleshy pink colour. Okay, and have we ever seen any of them before? Do any of them look like they might be healing or... It, it's difficult to tell. I mean, you don't have the the arcane knowledge to know like what goes into making these potions, or like if there's any sort of link between the colours and what the okay. effects are. So I'll put them away and suggest okay. that we get the alchemist in uh, New Zealand to have a look at them before we taste them. I want to try and read the language on that. Um, portal okay it'll take you a little while because obviously like Malcolm's pretty much hacked it to pieces but yeah that's fine I don't mind spending a minutes putting well, in that's the... fine make your uh, make your roll I passed I got 2% okay you see that it appears to be a circle that is calling upon what it refers to as like the power of the ancient ones or the old ones to lend their aid to arcane working so as malcolm had surmised you're now able to confirm that basically this is like it's effectively like an arcane like battery when it's powered up so whatever magic you a person would normally be able to do as a spellcaster if they've if they can feed the right energy into this sort of engraving to activate it it will then like boost whatever sort of magical workings they're doing it's probably you suspect 
how this like necromancer was able to make that abomination that you fought outside like using the the power of this sigil to like boost up his own magical power okay, so we've got a book on vampires uh, the rat man said lamb was being taken to the crimson king as an offering um I'm guessing it's not good for Lan. So, uh, oh, what do you want to do now? I think I think we've uncovered everything in here, have we? Or is there some path that we haven't? There's lots more beneath us. How do we get beneath us, though, without going down the Yeah, I mean, the but basically, drop? you suspect that what Quentin's sort of talking about is obviously the, there are further ways down in the sort of cavern system of the moor, so you could go, like, deeper into that. But um, obviously, but you, you don't know what lies below, and that's presumably that's, uh... not where the, the aim of your quest, which is Lan, has gone. And I'm, guess, I'm going to guess that uh, if the Crimson Sword was here, then the Crimson King most likely has it if he's had these agents here. So I mean, we could we could spend forever here searching for something that's not here. Yeah, did we have rumours that the sword was actually here? Didn't we? Originally, yeah, you know that the the last person to wield the night blade, reputedly, when the during the nights of colourless fire when the chaos stone exploded and the centre of the island collapsed in on itself creating the moor, reputedly he was like at ground zero, like holding yeah. the, the night blade and he like fell into this abyss as it was like formed. I'm guessing if it's here, it's gonna be at the bottom. And that's like hundreds of feet down, isn't it? In that ex it's expense bit. Days to weeks. Yeah. I, mean, I don't even know where the Crimson King is. Does anybody know where the Crimson King is? I think our last idea is that it's... Uh, I forget the current term for it, but there's a, there's a forest to the north uh, where I think... It was sort of signaled that that's that's where it is. The forest it, of Dracovia. Yeah. yeah. Was he sort of the undead vampire leader? Yeah, it's it's the um the sort of um to my ears anyway, it's the sort of classic thing where the vampire arist aristocracy rules over uh, like a peasant population. Uh, I was going to say, I don't think it's a, like a secret, is it? It's fairly no. Yeah, no. well documented and sort of you don't go there because that's where he is. Yeah, is it worth asking the sun sword if the night blade is here? Can he sense it? What about the green blade? Well, either the green blade doesn't talk. He gives you visions, doesn't it? Or something? Didn't it do something to yeah, show you? It gives a vision of um, Brother Nomas. Yeah, okay. But he can he can understand and you know, kind of gesture and, and nod and stuff, but we don't actually get any. Well, it's it's sense. probably worth trying both of them, though, isn't it? It's a yeah. Long, long shot, but. I'll, since we're here. There you go. So I'll. Um... I'll grasp the uh, the hilt of the sword. So, do you sense your siblings anywhere nearby? I can. I get a vague sense. The voice of the sword. I get a vague sense of the of the night blade's presence, but it is getting dimmer and more distant with every moment that passes. It's moving. It's no longer here. I say to everyone. So unless we want the healing stone, there's not really a lot to do. And again, they might have taken that as well. 
if they have discovered it. This what sorcerer. would that be then? What do we know about the healing stone? Fuck all. I was going to say, yes. Yeah. Sonny says Fabio. I was going to say, pr pretty, much, here. pretty much fuck <laughs> all, as, as your comrades have rightly said. Apart from like Fabio's like, oh, it's the most amazing thing. It's going to cure all ills and all diseases. And it's the miracle panacea, the cure all. But if they found this stone and this sword, then they would obviously take it with them because they're super powerful items. They ain't going to leave them lying around if they found them. And it sounds like they have. Well, certainly the sword, anyway. If it's moving. Not we might as well go and tool up to fight vampires, then. If... Uh, what's his face? Fabrio? Has any quick ideas about the stone? He, well, he, said, he says he doesn't have any new information, but obviously if you guys are like, we're leaving, he's not going to fucking press on into like the dangerous like underground unknown territories on his own. Well, previously, we used the glass glasses as like a trail, didn't we? Yeah. So is is there any, you know, did the glasses give off any sort of trail, like magical trail like they did before previously, the faint sort of mists? Okay, where are you? Where are you using the glasses to look? Show me on the map. Um, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sort of move to this sort of dead end almost, just to see if if it points sort of around the corner or back up the stairs, or if it doesn't show anything. Okay, roll me a d six. Okay, a six. Okay. As you put the glasses on in this area where many a foul, magical working has taken place recently, the entirety of this floor of the complex is lit up the brightest green you have ever seen. You hear, under the strain of such arcade energies, the, the lenses start to crack. You quickly sort of go to pull them off your face, but they explode in your hand, causing you three points of damage. cross off the lenses as they're overloaded by the sheer amount of foul magic that has been done here. I'm not sure who's got them on their list, but... Well, however, I can cross them off. Ah. So, yeah, I'll just discard what's left of them. Okay. Um, and what do we what do we know about the healing stone? Do we? It's a stone that yeah, heals people. Little more than um, Fabrio's ramblings, to be honest. It's uh, it's much like the philosopher's stone of our own time. It's it's this semi mythical stone that's reputed to be able to like cure all ills, turn base metals into gold, all sorts of fanciful like tales. But it's little more than a myth. I mean, you'd have probably heard legends of it yourselves, but like you know, in the case of like, oh, it's like a child's myth. It's only like since Fabrio turned up and he's like, "Oh, I've been seeking this all my life," that you've sort of maybe started taking it a little bit more seriously. Okay. So it does sound like a thing that could be useful when fighting vampires. Oh yeah. If that's the next move. Um. I don't know. What's a water Brock's thoughts on land and what's going on? Well, I think our time here is is done. I mean, we'll obviously search every box and drawer and everything in here just in case there's anything of use. But I think we've pretty much done that. Um, and we think land is being taken to this this vampire or crimson leader. This sorcerer is obviously working in conjunction with. Um, it's whether people are up for 
taken on such a task. You can only die once. Do it, I mean, what's what's the history behind this Crimson Guy, or what have we heard from our since we've returned? Have we, has he got like armies of? Well, from what you've heard, or... from what you've heard about um, Dracovia, apparently he sort of he stays in his in his like frozen castle with his like you presume lass of vampires like ruling over as uh, Weimar said the sort of peasantry and uh, you know that they extract what they call like the red tax which you presume is blood from the peasantry but it's not a secret thing. And they actively do seem to like, in their own way, like look after the peasantry, in return for this like red tax. Mm. But obviously, um, sort of being ruled over by vampires and sort of having to like donate blood regularly is not something that any sane person would uh, would want for themselves in at this point in time. But they're not like spreading across the land, you know. No, I mean it's one of the things. Destroying places, isn't it? It's one of the things that struck you as odd after the, after your time displacement exploring the Dolmen Wood. Like when you, before you went in there with the contact you had with the Crimson King, he was seemed to be solely concerned with his escape from the castle where he was bound, and sort of expanding his like knightly kingdom, his kingdom of vampires like across the world. Whereas after the time dislocation when you came back. He now appears to have sort of settled down and he's not trying to expand. He's just like, he's ruling by proxy over this, like, this Dracovia area, this sort of like forested area to the north with like some mountains where apparently his castle is. But he largely seems to have settled there. You've not really heard any like stories about like, you know, mad amounts of vampires like marching across the land or anything like that. Mm. Um,. Do I think there's any chance of catching up this carriage if we went on like single horseback? Like, I mean, there's a chance, but it, it's not a very big one. So no. If if what this uh, if what this prisoner Cyrus says is true, they probably left like a couple of days ago, so they've got like, mm. a couple of days head start on you. It's probably a fairly safe bet that like whatever horses are pulling their carriage don't need to rest. Yeah. So. There's a chance, but it's not going to be a massive chance. No. In it's fact, it's worth taking. Yeah. I mean, what did we bring with us? Did we bring our horses with us? Is that with the uh, the teams that guy? They're on the other side of. No, because he yeah. he was mining the boat on this side. Um. So I, I would say if if I was looking at the end the game mechanics, which I actually am, there's a there's probably like a seventy five percent chance, give or take, at the minute that the the carriage would reach the castle before you, like if you set off now. Hmm. So let's go and get loads of holy water, some eat, eat lots of garlic, <coughs> and then go after us. I mean, it's the sorcerer we want at the moment, rather than the um, the crimson guy. And what did he say? He was, a, he was taking as as a sacrifice. He it's said that he said he was taking her to uh, he was taking her to the the king to be his crimson queen. Crimson queen. That's a different proposition. Might be time for that horde of barbarians. Hmm. I think the uh... Uh, well, the Fire Lord can wait. The who? Well, the Dragon King, the yeah, Fire Lord, the, whatever he's called. Yeah, the the other one on the map here of our sort of current threats. Well, you don't know. If we survive this next thing, you know, fuck it. What's taking on a dragon? Yeah, yeah. But next, that's what I'm saying. We can, we can 
push off the fireball. Is that, let's, let's put the dragon in tomorrow's diary at entry. Yeah. <laughs> and we will... Next week's. Entry in mm. next Saturday. Yeah. yeah we, uh... Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> we, uh... I suggest we do what Quentin has been saying. We, uh... Go get the equipment. Eat a lot of garlic. Get more garlic to take with. And we head north. Uh, we're going to have friends, probably, in... Uh, what's that place that got targeted by the saboteurs of the Fire Lord that is Brackenwald. north of us? Yeah, uh, we're, we're, we're going to have friends there uh, who are currently, though, uh, essentially fighting their own war. Um, but we can probably pick up some uh, additionals from there as well, uh, in addition to whoever we can rouse up. And... Yeah, and obviously you got, as you rightly said, you guys know from what Quentin told you, I've been liaised with the Crimson Coin at the start, that basically that Brackenwald's getting all sort of geared up under the auspices of Lord Brackenwald to to get all his crusading knights and like crusade against the Fire Lord, who he believes, rightly or wrongly, is responsible for the, the disappearance of his nephew. Maybe we could convince him that it was the um, the crimson vampires. Mm. Has there been any proof either way who done it? Have they managed to get any evidence of? None that you're aware of. However, all of your sort of knowledge of this is coming from like the crimson coin, who basically Quentin sent to like, oh, go and use the portals to like rub Brackenwald for a bit, <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. and they, they stormed in expecting it to just be like a low alert sort of like, oh, we'll do a bit pickpocketing while we're there. They, they sort of went through the portal and were like, oh shit, this place is on like full military alert. We need to like grab what we can and like get out while the going's good before we get pinched. So they pretty much sort of like got a basic sort of like, oh, this is what's going on. Why there's like a big military build up? And then they got the fuck out. So they don't really have a lot of information. They certainly didn't go like, excuse me, uh, Town Guard, is there any like proof that like the Fire Lord did this? They were just like, oh, let's grab what cash we can and like GTFO before we get arrested. Mm. Like, quick, get, Someone... get to the portal. Someone blew up the doors, didn't they? Blew yeah, the gates that's, up. That's yeah, that was one of the changing saboteurs. And yeah. to, to be honest, in the in the absence of any other information, it may well be that that led to Lord Brackenwald putting two and two together and being like, oh, obviously the Fire Lords like stepped things up a little bit because he knows that his nephew was sent out with these uh, sages, are oh, we going to get these like herbs that will help us like identify these changelings more easily? Oh, and then like the sages got killed and his like nephews disappeared. So he's pro- there may well be other evidence you don't know about, but certainly that would probably be enough for Lord Brackenwald to be like, oh, it's obviously the Fire Lord or like his people who've done it to stop us trying to like out these changelings. You know, if I was a devious person, and I've had you are. centuries to live, you know, then I would certainly set things in motion to divert attention. You know, so it's highly possible, if they've not got much evidence, that the Crimson King is a more viable threat than a dragon. He's closer, isn't he? Potentially. Well, I'll tell you what, that's uh, on the map. I can't remember. Looking look on the map. Because Crimson Lord's down in the Hags, Hagshaw sort of mountains, isn't he? Yeah, you've got sort of the, the Crimson Lord sort of like, well, from Brackenwall, the Crimson Lord sort of here ish about. So that's like 144 odd miles. And then sort of Dracovia's like. Hundred odd miles. To the it's north, similar. So, so yeah, it's yeah. fairly similar. Dracovia is like marginally closer, but it's like when, very marginally. When you think of the map as well, lizard people. Like, everything I remember about lizards is they like hot climates. They're not so fond of the cold ones. You know, isn't the forest of Dracovia going to be more arid and? hospitable to that kind of thing yeah they were supposedly down in the uh, Wormspire Mountains weren't they 
yeah, the folk um, and the dragons. Yeah, it's believed that the sort of dragons and the lizard folk sort of around here, around yeah. the spire. Well, you don't know exactly where. You know that Hagshaw, which is here, has reputedly like cut a sort of non-aggression deal with them, so you can assume they're mm. in this sort of area somewhere. Otherwise, they wouldn't have bothered. How many days travel is it to the forest of Dracovia? Okay, well, you guys, if you're on like, if you're on like normal horse, like just riding horses, you can travel yep. about twenty-four miles a day. And like I right. say, if, you, if you're heading sort of straight from where you are now to like the border of the forest of Dracovia, it's like hundred and twenty miles. So we're going to need rations and horses. So you're talking, yeah, if you travel by like riding horses, you're talking like five, five days or so. Especially, especially as I imagine you, you'd like to get these people out of here. Plus we need holy water and garlic and steaks and... Silver. Silver yeah. works really well. Yeah, so if, if you're looking to... Uh, if you're planning to head back to New Zealand to, yeah. get, to get your provisions, obviously it's just over like a day a day and a half if you were heading north to sort of Brackenwald you're talking like two three days but obviously then you would be nearer to Dracovia when you set off from Brackenwald I mean tactically I would tool the fuck up and get out there you know we've got the portal to get us through to Brackenwald anyway um and then we can go to Akovi. If we're not going to catch them, then we may as well go kitted up to kill them. Yeah, I don't think we're going to catch them. Not without. I mean, my other. Not without leaving straight away. Enough. My other concern as well is if she's going to be the queen of the Crimson King, won't he have to make her into a vampire? So the land you see is not going to necessarily be the land you love. No, I think Brock has uh, come to that, you know, conclusion that it's not the person he he once knew already. Yeah, and I mean, as you as you sort of look into Brock's eyes as you say that, Quentin, you can see a sort of like steely, hardened resolve there. He's obviously under no illusions that you know he's going to go and rescue her. And it's all going to be like happy fun times, and he's going to settle down with her again. It now just seems like you know if, because you know uh, you know how Brock and how Lan, when she was like, alive, feel about sort of evil magics, it and obviously like making someone into a vampire is like high on the sort of evil juju list. So it now seems to Brock, and correct me if I'm wrong, Darren. It now seems when you're looking at him that it's more about him sort of like effectively like laying her to rest and making sure she like yeah, she has passed on her out of not, her misery yeah. yeah make sure she's not lingering as some like horrible like arcane undead wretch in like a a horrible like twisted blasphemous mockery of life no let's let's go get kitted up to do the job then and if the night blade is there, then that's going to essentially give us a, a two for one. Okay. So it's going to take you guys pretty much a day to get back to New Zealand. So you'll need a, a ration f for each of you and two rations for your surviving uh, hirelings, Gartag and Kamar, your teamster, who is indeed waiting with the boat when you get to shore and sort of helps you pole it over. You have a little sort of, I suppose, very sort of abbreviated like funeral service for the other the other hirelings who've died. Obviously, you will need to, since like two days have passed, you will need to pay two gold to Gartag and you will need to pay one gold to Kimar for that wages. I take the prisoners as well, obviously. Yeah, were prisoners. No problems. And you make your way back to New Zealand. And as you ride into New Zealand, Brock sort of steely in his resolve to, to lay his once beloved to rest and prevent this this blasphemous abomination, this this crimson queen. 
this empress of blood from sullying the memory of his once beloved Lan. That is where we're going to draw the session to a close for this evening, guys. Thank you very much for playing. I hope you all enjoyed the session. Yeah, thank you very much. much. And we will pick up next time with you guys sort of tooling up and heading out towards Dracovia. And obviously we're going to sort out XP and whatnot in a few moments. But for now, it just remains for me to say thank you to my wonderful players and to anyone who's watching this either now or in the future. I've enjoyed running it. I'm glad my players enjoyed playing it. Hopefully you've enjoyed watching it. And we'll see you next time. Take care.